Good morning. Uh, a number of you have asked me would I say something about the uh, Lausanne con Congress that I attended last week, and I plan to do that next week, so I'm not going to do that this morning. But as a kind of consolation prize, I thought I'd give you uh, a piece of information, and that is that uh, last night uh, the governing board of the college agreed to my nomination of the Reverend Dr Tony Payne to join the faculty in uh, January next year. And we hope to have another announcement next week, so stay tuned. Ten times in the book of Genesis, a new section begins with the words, these are the generations of. The first such marker comes in Genesis 2, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And in what follows, the world as we know it emerges. A world where harmony within the creation and fellowship with the creator is disrupted by the corrosive presence of sin. It just gets worse and worse. The rebellion in the garden, the murder of one brother by another, the celebration of violence and abuse in the case of Lamech. But there are shafts of light that pierce that darkness, an enigmatic promise in the garden, and right at the end, when Enoch is, Enosh is born, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. The second section, you might remember, began with these other generations of Adam in Genesis 5. And in it, we saw the ongoing consequence of a world gone wrong. And he died. And he died. And he died. But astonishing evidence, too, that God has not given up on human life, even in the face of human death. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. God, it seems, is not finished with the human race just yet. But unlike the first generation, that little glimmer of light is not where the section ends. Sin continues to spread as human beings continue to multiply. And it gets to such a point as to provoke the most catastrophic expression of God's judgment in the Old Testament, the flood. So let's look carefully at the first eight verses of Genesis chapter 6 because God has given these to us for a purpose. This is why judgment on that scale is necessary and appropriate and it anticipates judgment on an even larger scale at the end of time. So Genesis chapter 6. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we attend to your word this morning, that by your spirit you might address us, that you might convict us of those things we need to be convicted of, encourage us with those things that you've written for our encouragement, and help us to live as people of your word who follow the Lord Jesus with joy and with hope. And this we ask in his name. Amen. When God looked out on the world that he had made in Genesis 1, after the creation of the earth, the vegetation, the animal kingdom and, and human beings, 
we're told he saw everything that he had made and it was very good. But here in this section, we're told that God looked out again and this time the assessment is very different indeed. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he'd made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. In the beginning, he had looked out and he delighted in what he saw. It was very good. It fitted exactly with his purpose for it. But now here in Genesis 6, he looks out and it grieved him to his heart. For it denied his purpose, spat on his goodness, defied his person. What is it that made the difference? What turned God's delight into his grief? What happened? And how is it a warning to us? Well, firstly, sex, violence, and grasping at eternity. You could fill up a very great deal of your time by reading everything that has been written about the strange little incident at the beginning of Genesis 6. It's raised a lot of questions over the years. Who exactly were those involved? What was it that they actually did? Why did it provoke the Lord to say, my spirit shall not abide with man forever, for his flesh and his days shall be 120 years? What is clear is that some kind of barrier is crossed in these verses, and the crossing of that barrier is something the Lord takes very seriously indeed. Whether the sons of God are angels who abandoned their proper place and crossed the barrier between heavenly creatures and earthly creatures, or whether the sons of God are the descendants of Seth, the godly line of promise, who crossed a line when they entered into marriage with the daughters of man, the ungodly family of Cain living under the curse. In either case, a dividing line that God has created is ignored and trampled upon. And God takes that seriously. For you see, God the creator sets the boundaries for human life. And the boundaries he has determined must not be transgressed. Whether it be between the sexes, God created us male and female, and to transgress that boundary is to invite God's wrath or between protecting life and ending it, claiming for yourself the right to terminate life when only God gives life and only God rightly takes it away, or between worship and idolatry, calling upon the living God in spirit and in truth, or imagining your own way of relating to God. Special things, special places, special rituals, special feelings. God sets the boundary and to cross it is to defy him. It is once again deciding for yourself what is good without taking notice of what God has to say, ignoring the line that God has put in place. It's about taking what is on the other side of that line. Think about it for a moment, that's what happened in the garden. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, she took some of its fruit. She crossed that line between what was freely, abundantly given and what was forbidden. And that's what's happening here too. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were, you might say, a delight to the eyes and they took as their wives as many as they chose. Seeing, delighting, taking, and all without any regard for God's word, his will, and his purpose. And so I need to ask you this morning, do you have your heart set on something on the other side of the line? You've heard God's word? You know the boundaries that he has put in place, 
but something on the other side of those boundaries seems so attractive, so good, a delight to the eyes, and you trample the line God has put in place in his creation in order to take it. Or you will if you get the chance. In this instance, I think we can see three elements and each of them is still able to entice and ensnare us. The first is sex, such a powerful God-given facet of human existence, good as God gave it to be good. The daughters of man were attractive. The sons of God took them as their wives. They had sex with them and the daughters of man bore children to them. But the reaction of God makes clear something seriously has been done. Enticed by something that looked so good, they crossed the boundary for, sex, for the sake of sex. The second is power. The mighty men of old, the, the men of renown, the Nephilim, giants, intimidating, epitomes of violence before whom others quake in fear. And once again, the reaction of God to their appearance on the scene makes clear that something very serious has been done. Men of power, enjoying the control it brings. As one writer puts it, violence idolised. The third, just perhaps, is a grasp at immortality. The blurring of the boundary between angels and humanity, heaven and earth, if that's what it was, raise the prospect of life without the limitations imposed by the creator and exacerbated by the curse. And that is why God insists, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. You're still just flesh and it won't go on forever. There is no other route to eternity than the one God himself will provide. See, the restless human heart seeks and still seeks today the joy lost in the garden, some kind of control over the circumstances and those around us and escape from the limits that confine us. But our hearts seek these things in all the wrong places on the other side of the line we feel the pull across the line which God has set in place as part of his creation. That's the reality that bubbles up in a peculiar way in Genesis 6. So what happens here is not trivial or inconsequential or irrelevant. Defying the world as God has made it to be, fooling ourselves that we can recast it in any way we want, to, want it to be, Surrender to the pull of people, things and experiences on the other side of the line God has himself drawn between good and evil. That's how the sin in the garden replicates itself in life outside the garden. And the problem is deeper and more insistent than we know. And so we come to God's assessment of the situation, which I read just a few moments ago from verse 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. However else our contemporaries might want to sum up the human condition, yeah, vulnerable but basically decent perhaps, uh, innocent, victims of the forces all around us that shape us, perhaps, on the path towards perfection, perhaps. God's assessment is devastating at this point. Great wickedness, every intention of the thoughts of his heart, only evil, all the time. The problem with the human race, the real problem, is deeper and more insistent than we are willing to admit. Our natural condition is not just a matter of individual foolish choices, it's rather a matter of a disoriented and diseased heart. And it is so bad, so insistent, so deep and wide in each of us 
that it will require something on a monumental scale to save us. Here is the origin of the Christian doctrine of total depravity. Not that we are all as evil as we can be, but that evil touches every bit of who we are, all of us, all the time. And the point is that unless you get to the point of admitting that, something Genesis 6 demands of us, you won't cast yourself fully and entirely on the only hope that God provides. The great doctor, Martin Luther, of course, famously remarked early in his career that it is certain that man must utterly despair of his own ability before he is prepared to receive the grace of Christ. What he meant was that while you still have some hope that there's a spark of good in you, only a spark, but it's still not snuffed out completely, that somehow because you are not as bad as you know you can be or could be, you've escaped the full force of the contagion, then you won't throw yourself entirely on the mercy of the Saviour. And this part of Genesis, Genesis 6, with this strange little incident of the sons of God and the daughters of man, but more importantly, the response of the Lord to what they do, is given to us to blow apart any illusions we might have about ourselves. Every intention of the thoughts of our hearts, only evil, all the time, left to ourselves, that is the dreadful sobering truth. Without grace, without the work of the spirit, that's us, that's you, that's me. It's the universal human condition, and it is far, far more than skin deep. And as I said, if that is true, it will take something monumental to save us. And we'll get a glimpse of that in the next few chapters as we come to the flood next week. It's an act of judgment on a monumental scale, an act of judgment which involves the entire creation. But you and I know that the flood won't solve the problem. And that was that what was said about the natural human heart before the flood remains true of the natural human heart after the flood. Something bigger even than that will be needed if we're going to be rescued from our own hearts. But the hope that such a rescue will be provided is locked into these verses as well. Did you see it? God does make an assessment of the human condition in these verses. He does expose the state of the natural human heart and he does pronounce judgment in verse 7, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. But there's something more, something that makes very clear that this is not just a, a clinical diagnosis of a terminal condition, nor is it the dispassionate exercise of justice by the judge of all the earth. It's that final little clause in verse 6. And it grieved him to his heart. God is not just appalled by human sin. He's not just angry with human sin. He's not just determined to deal with and eliminate human sin. He is grieved by human sin. This is not simply a, a mechanical reaction to what he's observed on the earth. It's not an arm's length, external, abstract, impersonal response to one act of defiance built upon another and another and another. This strikes to the heart of who God is. And God's response is rightly described as grief because he loves and he does not stop loving. He loves what he has made. He's not simply given up on it. And because he loves, he's grieved to his heart by the sin he sees on earth. And even in the midst of horrifying judgment, he will not give up. The grief of God is his response of love 
to his creation which is turned in on itself and harming itself in defiance of him. God himself has not changed. He's not been unsettled or dissuaded from his plan, but he cannot pretend this has not happened and he cannot stand off afar from the pain and self-destruction of human beings in their defiance of him. He grieves at human sin and that is why he acts. And that is why this strange little passage ends not with terror or paralysis in the face of catastrophe. Despite the appalling and frightening judgment of verse 5, no, it, it ends with the words, and Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. And so in the most unlikely place, as I said, right beside the, the foundational text for the doctrine of total depravity, we find grace. We are utterly lost. Naturally, we are riddled with this terminal contagion, but God's heart won't let that be the final word. He was grieved to his heart, but that grief and the love from which it stemmed gave us Noah. And finally, it will give the only real answer to the problem of human sin in the life and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So shall we pray? Heavenly Father, please help us to be honest about the human condition, to be thankful for what you have done and to live in hope of that day when all sin will be wiped away forever with every tear and all grief. And this we ask of you in Jesus' name. Amen.